I'm Morton Lordson. I'm Distinguished Professor of Composition at the Thornton School of Music at the University of Southern California. I've been associated with this university both as a student and a faculty for now 52 years. And I'm happy to talk with you today. Poetry is a huge part of my life. I read it every day. I am nourished by it in so many ways. Poets inform us. They help us to deal with situations, with the human condition, with, with life and death and loss and love and, and beauty. They do it through words. We musicians are doing it through notes. When I and I read poetry every single day. I, one of my great joys is to prowl bookstores and simply go to the poetry section. And I will begin reading and I'll go from book to book to book and look at something. And when I find a poem for which I have a visceral reaction to it, then I will go out and buy everything I can by that particular poet to see if it will allow itself a setting to music. And I look for the, uh, the use of the language, I look for the overall thematic content of it. And I'm very, very much interested in everything else about it. When it was written, who it was written by, and I explore the, the life of the poet deeply. And I'm looking for those themes that, that are filled with symbolism and that also to speak to the, to the listener and to the performer. This is why I think one of the reasons that the Luke's Eterna is done everywhere in the world. We're talking about eternal life and, and the light and the symbolism of that. Illumination. Spiritual? Sure. Creative? Sure. Intellectual? Sure. Illumination of all sorts. When I wrote that poem, when my, I got the news, my mother was dying. So I hung on to ancient Latin scriptures with a the common theme of illumination. And it helped me get through a patch in my life. You know, I see the letters I get almost daily about that piece. Other people hanging on to my piece now, going through some awful patch. So I look for these, the combination of all the things I just explained and mentioned in a poem. I'll give you another example. I'm going to read an Aruda poem. Now, we've all read poems about love throughout our life. We, we love the way that poets treat that idea. I, I, idea. Now this is an English translation made by one of my sons. I set it in the original Spanish because I set all my pieces in the original language. I want to do that. But I want you to, to hear this. Just take a moment and listen to what I consider, for me, the most beautiful love poem I've ever read. So this is Neruda. When I die, I want your hands upon my eyes. I want the light and the wheat of your beloved hands to pass their freshness over me one more time. I want to feel the gentleness that changed my destiny. I want you to live while I wait for you asleep. I want your ears to still hear the wind. I want you to smell the scent of the sea we both love and to continue walking on the sand we walked on. I want all that I love to keep on living, and you, whom I loved and sang above all things, to keep flowering into full bloom, so that you can touch all that my love provides you, so that my shadow may pass over your hair, so that all may know the reason for my song. Now, the process on this, what do I do on something like that? And I'll give you some examples of the piano, just nubs of beginnings on the piano. If you go to your English department and say, name the 10 greatest writers in the 20th century, Rilke will show up probably on all the lists. The man wrote in German for the most part. And it was very interesting, the last two years of his life, he went out to the town of Mouzot, Switzerland, little Berg and wrote 400 poems in French. And I set a set of them for a professional choir up in Portland, Oregon, 
that uh, was doing a concert of chanson, and I thought I would add to that as well. Okay, and the first one I, I wrote, and I thought I was just going to be limited to this, uh, was a poem about a rose, a little tiny nub of a poem about a rose being slightly narcissistic. I decided to set this as a, an encore piece for this particular consort, just a, a little light-hearted, fun piece, nothing fancy, to end the program, an encore piece. And I decided to put on my songwriting writer's hat and set it as a, in the style of a French chanson populaire. So now I have a focus. Here is the focus. I want to set a, a little tiny poem in the style of a chanson populaire in French written in 1924. All of those factors come together. French, 1924. I want to make it sound French. How do I make it sound French? Who's writing music about that time that we could all think about? Ravel, Debussy, it's that particular era. What's a French sound harmonically? This is a French sound harmonica. That's simply a chord that Debussy and Ravel loved. It's a tried with an added second to it. That's my piece of music, too, because part of the compositional technique will be to use those four notes to make a piece out of it. Now, that's my sound. The second part of it is technical. What is a folk song? What is a French folk song? All right, folk song can't be complicated because it's going to be passed down by an oral tradition, not a written tradition. It has to be short, has to be limited range melody, has to be easily sung, easily remembered, probably repetitive, probably accompanied by a guitar. I don't have a guitar, but I got to have a piano. Let's, t let's take the piano and turn it into a guitar. So I take these four notes and make it, like it sound like it's a guitar. Same four notes, just inverted. Same four notes. Now take those four notes from the chord and make a melody out of them. Those are three of the four notes. Now I want to be able to remember that. So let's do it again, but let's keep it fresh with a how about a new harmony? And flip the appoggiatura around one more time. Ah, okay. New note time. Freshman theory, melody writing 101. I have to have a new note. And here it comes. That's it. That's motive number two. Let's do that again. Then, then I'm focusing on the reciting tone that I learned from studying medieval chant. Where the monks would say, okay, we have the dominant. Robert Graves is writing about the hole in his life when he was abandoned by his mistress, Laura Writing. 
dying sun shine warm a little longer. It was very passionate. So I figured it, that's the, the way that this poem starts. So I figured, okay, if I could set the words dying sun, they are going to tell me a great deal about this piece. So here's, a, here's an English man, English writer, and he's got a bunch of angst. So we have to have a, a feeling of angst. Dying sun. That's a choir doing that. Dying sun. There is a wealth of information there. First of all, I have four chords to explore compositionally. What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? And I will explore those at great length, do various inversions and so on. Secondly, oh, it's a, and we you know from your theory, it is a, a mixolydian, which is one of our modes, progression. It's basically going. Scottish snap, short long. And then also, the idea of seconds going across the page. The altars are doing this. Tenors are going. Ah, oh, a piece about seconds. It become ninths. go with that. So my materials are gathered the impetus of the, of the, the vocal. Dying son. The guy's at, he, he's, he's a very unhappy camper. He's, he's lost everything. What about the same kind of thing? What about unrequited love in the Madrigali? The Italians. This is what we learn here at the Thornton School. I spent a lot of time studying the music of Marenzio and Monteverdi and Gesualdo and all that. And the Italians, of course, in the 16th century are talking about unrequited love, where the English are, you know, chasing fair Phyllis all over the hills, and it's going to work out just fine. And they're doing... <laughs> not the Italians. You know, this is bad news. It's not going to work out. And so I tried to find one particular chord from which the music could spring by, and I call it the fire chord. And it goes all the way through six different poems that are glued together in re Renaissance Italian poems by the image of fire in a romantic sense. I'm burning for you, you inflame me, I'm, you know, all this kind of stuff. What's the chord? Here it is. This is my fire chord. That's how that piece that the USC Chamber Singers premiered, that Minor chord with an added ninth. And off we go. And where's that ninth going to be? Is it going to be down here? Ah, hi, it's right down here. Ah, where did that progression come from? Well, it came from the Dorian mode. This is what you study. All of these kinds of things. So you can see how that early training. Here's a young man coming down here, diving into... English classes and being instructed on better ways to understand contemporary poetry, for example, or poetry in general, and using it every day and starting my class every day. It's so much fun. I go in there. Does anyone have a poem? And uh, someone say, yeah, I, I do. There's one by a guy named Frost about a pastor. And I say, okay, let's, let's read that, and we'll talk about it. So it just takes everyone up a peg. Look, I've done over 100 residencies at various universities. I go around talking about poetry and the importance of that, how it's affected my music, and how it should affect everyone. Don't forget, dear Mr. Lordson, thank you very much for visiting us, visiting our campus. I uh, went out and bought some Neruda. My husband and I are reading it to each other now, each night before we go to bed. It's enriched our lives, thank you very much. Thank you.